the Americas at the beginning of the 16th century. People live here, millions of them, from the Arctic Sea to the tip of South America. People living in harmony with all that grows, with the creatures of the earth and sky. But now, early in the 16th century, these people, these first Americans, are threatened by strange, light-skinned men who have come from behind the horizon in huge boats. I, an Indian, have agreed to tell you the story of the white man's conquest of the Americas. Columbus has come and gone four times. Vespucci, Cabot, Cabral, Pineda have all come here, but only to touch on the coast. Now, in 1519, a 34-year-old Spanish adventurer called Hernando Cortez leads an army of nearly 500 men inland from the swampy shore of Veracruz. His goal, Tenochtitlan, city of the Aztecs. We can go faster. Oh, you, I'll leave you here for the lizards. What is it over there? Get those horses moving. So many cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land. We were amazed. And some of our soldiers even asked whether the things we saw were not in a dream. Diaz, scratching away in your little diary again. I say you'll go blind from all that scribbling. This is a wondrous place, General. I must describe it. Let our blessed king know of your service. Service? Ha <laughs> ha, Diaz. I am here for the blessed wealth and all that goes with it. We Spaniards are troubled with the disease of the heart, for which gold is the specific remedy. Now don't fall behind. Soon we shall reach Tenochtitlan, and then... Ha <laughs> ha! We'll all be wealthy as kings! In the middle of the Valley of Mexico stands Tenochtitlan, largest city in America, larger even than the city of London in this year of 1519. Surrounded with water, approached only by narrow causeways, it is a fortress impregnable to Indian assault. We had instructions, you see, from our god of war and sun, the god we call Left-Handed Hummingbird. He told us to find a spot where an eagle was perched on a cactus and devouring a snake. And this is where we found the sign, on a small island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. Each of the three causeways to the city has bridges that we can raise should enemy warriors try to enter Tenochtitlan. Moreover, the lake is full of fighting canoes to attack the enemy on the causeway from both sides. Enough talk of fighting. Instead, come and see our houses, most of them with courtyards that are filled with flowers. Oh, the flowers. Smell them. Oh. This is one of the markets where vendors offer all the products of the corn empire. Corn beans, squash, corn beans, squash. This way, come this way. Here, near the center of the city, are our palaces, the temples and ceremonial buildings. Keep walking that way. See the high stone wall ahead? The one decorated with carved snakes? Go through the opening and you will find yourself in a wide courtyard. There you will see our sacred pyramid topped by the temples of our gods. Go on. Keep going. Right through that passage there. You wish to visit our temples, do you? Then climb these stone stairs to the top, all the way up to the two temples. Don't mind those men in black robes up there. They're priests. Go on up. They're waiting for you. Don't go up those stairs to visit the temple of the god, left-handed hummingbird. 
for despite his pleasant name, he is a god who hungers for the fresh, bleeding hearts of human victims. As you reach the top of the steps, you'll see that the long hair of the priests is matted with blood. There are five of them waiting there, four to hold you down on the stone altar. The fifth one holds a sharp knife made of obsidian. The Aztecs loved flowers. They built a beautiful city in the middle of a lake. They developed an orderly civilization. But they were a warlike people who worshipped bloodthirsty gods. At the head of the Aztec government in 1519 is a monarch who has ruled successfully for 17 years, Montezuma II, descendant of the sun. Now in his palace in Tenochtitlan, he is preparing to eat his one meal of the day. Montezuma sits on a low throne. Before him is a table covered with white cloths and napkins. It is very quiet in the palace, for while Montezuma is at table, one risks his life by making any noise. Now four beautiful women present him with water for his hands, then towels. More than 300 separate dishes have been prepared for Montezuma, though he will sample only a few of them. The first platter is set before him. He stares down at it, frowning, then sweeps it off the table onto the floor. He gets up from the table and walks out onto a balcony overlooking the city. What is wrong? He is worried about the white-skinned ones coming toward our city. Well, why doesn't he send our army out to kill them? It is said they are very few in number. True, but there have been sign after sign, all bad. A, a trembling of the earth and a woman's voice crying in the night. That is why Montezuma broods. Look at him, standing out there, staring down into the canal. Meanwhile, the foreign devils get closer and closer. Can't you do something, priest? You forget. When our god, the feathered serpent, was exiled, he sailed away on a magic raft, but promised to return in a one-reed year to punish us and to re-establish his rule. But he didn't return in the first one-reed year, did he? Nor in the second. But this year, this is a one-reed year. And it is very possible that the leader of the white-skinned ones is our god, the feathered serpent, returning to us. It is also possible that he is not our god. That is why Montezuma stares into the canal. Great left-handed hummingbird, why have you not given me a new sign? I personally offered you many sacrifices, and still you choose to remain silent. The white ones are seen near the gates. They come at my invitation, half man, half beasts. They ride animals that look like giant deer. And though they have allied themselves with our enemies, they would be nothing before my army. And yet, and yet, O oh, feathered serpent, is that you coming back to Tenochtitlan? <laughs> but, General, I still think it would be prudent of us not to enter the Imperial City tomorrow. Oh, come, come, Lieutenant. Don't we have an invitation from Montezuma himself? And for company, we'll take 5,000 of our new Tlaxcalan allies with us. It could be a trick. Once we're across the causeway, the Aztecs... Nonsense. Could... You haven't been listening closely to what my most cherished interpreter has been telling me. Doña Marina, would you repeat for my lieutenant the Aztec legend of the feathered serpent? Do you wish to hear all of it? Yes, all of it, please. Especially the part at the end where this so-called god is supposed to return as a white-skinned figure with a black beard. <clears throat> Something like mine, perhaps. Uh, I'm sorry, Marina. Please begin. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, was a god of creation, agriculture, and a patron of learning. He did not require human sacrifice, but he was driven out of the Valley of Mexico by another god. Have there been any new signs? Nothing, my lord. We sacrificed 2,000 more captives, 
We have worn the skins of the captives 20 days. Surely the guards are pleased. But no new signs. Our present guards seem to have deserted us. Why then not welcome the return of our old guard, the Feathered Serpent? If indeed the man with the black beard is the true Feathered Serpent. Tomorrow, we will welcome the white-skinned ones. We will let them come into the city in peace. There is not time enough to tell all that happened before Cortez conquered the city by force. After first being welcomed peacefully, Cortez and his men kidnapped Montezuma. Montezuma was killed by his own people. The Spaniards were driven out of Tenochtitlan, then returned the next year with thousands of Indian allies to capture the city. What, you talk of the bombing of Dresden? The casualties at Hiroshima, Nagasaki? Then look on the streets of Tenochtitlan after the 75-day siege by the Spanish. Those are the Aztec dead, you see. Over 120,000 of them. Ah, Dios. This horrible victory. This city, the most beautiful of treasures, now rubble. These bloated bodies, the stench. The sun makes it all worse. It should be shining on the most glorious trophy of Hernando Cortez. And instead, is the sun not cruel? <laughs> So, my friend, you see what remains of our city, a city feared and admired by all who knew its name. Now, what will the stories tell of us, children of the sun? They will only tell of the gold, the battle, and the blood. Then our children will no longer listen to our stories. Stories of the medicine men? They could not stop the pale invaders. Children will not listen to stories of old fools. Then they will not hear of our creator, the sun. They will only hear of the new god whom the invaders tell us to worship. Will our children listen when it is told that after the battle was lost... Our last leader, Quatemoc, would not tell where the royal treasure lay hidden, even though the Spaniards roasted him alive? Tell them. Tell them. Yes, tell them. What good is treasure to dead men? Speak, Quatemoc. Tell them. Do I stand upon a bed of roses? Our children will hear the Spanish tell of rich treasures. But they must also hear of Quatemoc, gravely, silently, taking this secret with him back to the sun. Not every Spanish conqueror arrives at the head of an army with banners flying. One comes from the West Indies to the mainland, nailed up inside a wooden barrel. Don't laugh. He had himself stuck in the barrel and loaded aboard a ship to get away from his creditors on the island of Hispaniola. They were about to throw him into jail for not paying his debts. But now he's in worse trouble if somebody doesn't get him out of the barrel. Juan! Juan! Come over here! There is noises coming from inside this barrel. What? Noise, Sancho? 
You spent too much time ashore last night. What makes noises inside a barrel? Come and help me open it. That crowbar. Aha. They put gentlemen in barrels now. Uh, thank you, good sailors. That cask would soon have been my casket. <laughs> now, if I can just straighten this left elbow. Ah. No. I am ready. Please inform your captain that Vasco Nunez de Balboa wishes to speak with him. We've dropped back a few years to tell about Balboa, the barrel, and the discovery of the Pacific Ocean. Of course, you realize that my ancestors were fishing and hunting in the waters of the Pacific for thousands of years before Balboa was even born. But we're telling the white man's history now, so... The ship that Balboa stowed away on was carrying supplies and reinforcements to a Spanish garrison on the coast of what is now Colombia. It wasn't long before Balboa himself took over command of the garrison, and apparently he got along quite well with the local Indians, for they allowed him to build a town on the coast. Later they worked for him in the fields and in his gold mines. It is from the Indians that he hears stories. Woman. Did you ask that old fellow what lies over the mountains? He says he will show you a country paved with gold. You must pass over the mountains first, then see the great ocean, the South Sea. Ah, that all we've been told is true. This is the narrow place, and on the other side is the great sea. In 1513, Balboa leads an expedition of less than 200 Spaniards across the isthmus to make his famous discovery. It might interest you to know that one of the men with him on this march is the future conqueror of Peru, Francisco Pizarro. On September 29, 1513, Balboa wades into the shallows of the Pacific Ocean and makes his claim. I, Vasco Nunez de Balboa, hereby claim this mighty sea and all the shores washed by it in the name of our most serene king of Castile. Long live the high and mighty sovereigns well, Pizarro, of Castile. What do you think? Thus in is it as large as the great ocean we crossed from Spain? What does it matter? It is only water and, and the jungle is only prince. jungle. Whether it is Christian gold that matters and territory and slaves. One day I shall make this puny effort appear as a grain of sand on this forsaken beach. The just claims of my sovereigns. Long live the sovereigns of Spain. Now I must tell you of the bloody conquest of Peru by Francisco Pizarro. In the 16th century, the Inca Empire extended all the way from present-day Ecuador to central Chile and was run by a highly organized central government. This type of government proved to be a weakness for the Incas when Pizarro arrived with his small army and proceeded to take Atahualpa, their emperor, prisoner. With the emperor in his power, Pizarro found that he had the entire Inca Empire under his control. Well, Atualpa, my lord Pizarro, we approached you unarmed, and you set upon my people and killed them by the thousands. Now I wish for my freedom. You come for gold. I shall fill this room with gold. And I will fill two smaller rooms with silver. I will fill these rooms to this height, high above my head. The heathen lies, General. He is full of deceit. Take Ash, care. Padre. I have come too far to fear trickery from a defeated Indian, even a king. So, Atualpa, it is agreed. I accept. Bring on your gold and your silver. I have crossed an ocean. I have overcome the cruelest of misfortunes. 
and mighty foes have fallen before my sword, it is fitting that my reward be remarkable. I have fulfilled my promise. If you are pleased, my lord, may I now have my freedom. Hmm, I think not, Atuelpa. It has come to my attention that you have been sending secret messages out to your people, urging them to revolt. But that is not true. You can see for yourself that my people are not about to resist you in any way. Don't worry. You shall have a trial. A fair trial. And so, Atahualpa, Emperor of the Incas, is put on trial for his life. The trial itself is a farce, of course. Pizarro promptly finds the Inca guilty and sentences him to be burned at the stake. Chained hand and foot, Atahualpa is bound to a stake. Wood is piled around him to his waist, and the executioner awaits the signal to set it on fire. Atahualpa, listen to me. You can still be saved. If you agree to be baptized as a Christian, you will not be burned, I promise you. In fact, I'll see that not a drop of your blood is spilled. Will you agree? Atahualpa agrees, and a priest is brought in to perform the rite of baptism. He is christened Juan de Atahualpa. Remove the wood. Cut him loose from the stake and take him out to the public square. But, my general, it will be dangerous to let the Inca go free. I promise not to spill a drop of his blood, didn't I? Yes. Well, then take him to the public square and see that he is strangled to death. So now they are gone. The ancient civilizations of the Americas and the men who conquered them. All gone. What will our children remember of us? They will only remember human sacrifices the hearts we cut out still beating to offer to the great sun. What else will they remember? Let them come into the city in peace. I, Vasco Nunez de Balboa, hereby claim this mighty sea. A disease of the heart for which gold is the specific remedy. I shall fill this room with gold. I have overcome the cruelest of misfortunes. Do I stand on a bed of roses? And some of our soldiers even asked whether the things we saw were not in a dream. In a dream. A dream. <laughs> 